good morning and welcome to today's public forum, ISIS public forum on the Mekong mainland, Axis of Prosperity, Security and Competition. Uh, I want to proceed, uh, we have limited time. We're missing one speaker, so we'll try to uh, chase him down. I think he may have uh, been lost on campus or somewhere in Bangkok. Um, anyway, he's, an ex he's truly an expert on the Mekong region, uh, Dr. Ruth Panom Yong. So I hope he's on his way. Um, let us begin with uh, uh, welcome remarks, I think, from, from the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Ek Tang uh, Sapwatana. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, good morning and warm welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I have the pleasure of opening uh, today's ISIS public forum on uh, the Mekong mainland, uh, axis of prosperity, security and competition. Our title today may seem like misplaced. You may be asking how a river like Mekong can be uh, placed next to the mainland. In fact, uh, the title is intentional. We want to focus on mainland Southeast Asia, a clutch of countries and economies that revolve around uh, the Mekong River. There are different top ways of conceptualizing the Mekong region. Over the past two decades, these countries, namely Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Yunnan and Guangxi uh, in southern China are known as GMS or Greater Mekong uh, Sub-Region. However, geography tells us that these countries also comprise the mainland half of ASEAN. Referring to Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. The mainland countries, specifically uh, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand, or CLFG, are also seen as coming under China's influence as opposed to the maritime ASEAN countries that have had territorial tension in, uh, with uh, Beijing. So there are distinct differences between mainland and maritime Southeast Asia. And our focus today is the mainland. The Mekong region is a fascinating axis of the economies that have been expanding at impressive growth rates. In fact, the growth trajectories of these countries are likely to go up for at least the foreseeable uh, decade. Yet, the security environment of the Mekong region is fraught with uncertainty, especially uh, with the conflicting interests of upstream and downstream uh, countries and the increasing concern over environmental degradation. In addition, we are interested in the Mekong region because of the growing geopolitical competition among the major powers. In view of these regional countries and dynamics, we have an impressive lineup of experts to discuss them today. I would like to thank each of the speakers from Mr. Tetsuya Ikushi of uh, Nikkei ASEAN Review and Nikkei Group for his support to uh, Dr. Ulrich uh, Sachu uh, of the World Bank, uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Anom Yong, who may come soon, of uh, Tamazat University Business School, uh, Mr. Akila uh, Malukochi of uh, Mitsubishi, uh, Thailand, uh, Dr. Titinan of ISIS, and uh, Ms. Gwen Robinson, who is a senior ASEAN editor of Naked ASEAN Review and uh, ISIS senior uh, fellow. Many thanks again for joining us. I now return the floor to Kun Gwen, uh, our moderator of this morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Tetsuya Iguchi, uh, editor in chief for Nikkei's Asian editorial headquarters, uh, which was set up 
uh, here in Bangkok in March this year at the base for editing and news reporting for our new English language news service, uh, the Nikkei Asian Review. And uh, we are very much honored to be involved in this ISIS seminar. Uh, where we could exchange various views on the important issues for Asia. So let me make some uh, comments uh, relating to today's topic and uh, start with a question. Uh, do you know a disease called uh, PSS? Of course you don't uh, because I made it up. But actually uh, it does exist and it's really scary. And uh, once you contract this disease, uh, you suffer from low economic growth and can even fall into uh, negative growth and deflation. As a result, the government debt piles up and even if the central bank scatters tons of money from helicopters, uh, the economy will not pick up. So what do you think this PSS is? Uh, that is what I have named uh, Population Shrink Syndrome. And it started in Japan, and it's going to creep up on other Asian countries. An important measurement to diagnose this disease is the population of working age people uh, who are statistically uh, between uh, 15 and 64 years old. And this working age population is important because it indicates the size of the workforce and uh, represents the you know, most active uh, consumers. So if this population starts decreasing, uh, it is very difficult for the country's economy to grow. So in the case of Japan, uh, it was in 1996 that this working age population uh, started shrinking. Then Japan's nominal GDP in yen terms peaked in 1997 and decreased in 2013 by 9% compared with the peak, a, a peak year of 1997. And the deflation started in 1999. And Bank of Japan is still fighting against it, uh, shooting out tons of money with bazooka. And do you have any idea which Asian countries might be next victims of this disease? China, South Korea, and Thailand. Uh, according to the United Nations, the working age population of those countries are going to are uh, projected to be to start decreasing uh, before 2020. Of course, as those countries is in uh, are in the different stages of economic development from that of Japan, uh, the impact might be different. But there is no doubt that. Uh, you know, steady decline of economic, uh, steady decline of working age population will limit those countries' economic growth. But don't worry, uh, there is a treatment for this disease, uh, one which Japan would not take. That is opening up your country. It's not just welcoming foreign workers to make up for decreasing domestic workforce. It's also essential to have good connectivity with neighboring countries so that you can build broad supply chain beyond, beyond the national borders and uh, at the same time have better access to growing consumer market of neighboring countries. So fortunately, Thailand is surrounded by countries whose populations of younger generations are still growing. And I think that is why it is crucial for Thailand to have close relations with Mekong region countries. And uh, in that sense, I am very interested in what today's panelists will have to say about the development and the future of Mekong region. So thank you for listening. So we have a, an excellent lineup of panelists today, um, which could be a little more excellent if Dr. Ruth turns up, um, which he may at any point. But uh, for now, I'll just uh, I'll just uh, introduce you briefly to the speakers we do have, um, starting with uh, to my right, 
Dr. Uh, uh, sorry, Akira Murakoshi, who is uh, the senior vice president of Mitsubishi Corporation and uh, president of Mitsubishi Company Thailand and Thai MC Company Limited, uh, who is on his second assignment in Thailand and is um, very familiar with the region, has seen it develop over his earlier period and now. He joined Mitsubishi after graduating from Tokyo University in 1982 and has since worked in many aspects of the group from ceramics and minerals to Bridgestone tires and in Brazil so uh, he's got a truly international perspective um, I don't think the man next to me on my right needs much introduction but Dr. Titinan Pongsudirak is director of the in Institute of Security and International Studies um, and uh, associate professor of international political economy at the Faculty of Political Science in Chulalongkorn University and as you all know is um, has authored uh, numerous uh, articles, <coughs> books and book chapters on uh, Thailand, ASEAN, East Asian security, economic cooperation um, and uh, has uh, particularly I think ordered, authored a very striking article on the Greater Mekong um, sub-region so we're hoping to uh, have some real insights there and um, and finally um, to my left last but not least is Ulrich Zakhal who joined uh, the World Bank group uh, and uh, has come to this region from 2012 he's uh, he's had a very impressive career with the World Bank, uh, holding various staff and management positions uh, right through uh, Asia, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and has degrees in mathematics and economics from the University of Munich, uh, as well as a PhD in economics from Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, and before joining the World Bank, he worked for McKinsey and & Company and taught economics at the University of Bonn. So um, I'd like to perhaps begin with you, Ulrike. I know that you've got a very interesting presentation, uh, um, a PowerPoint uh, prepared. So let's start with that and uh, continue on. Thank you, Gwen. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so it's, I'm the first speaker on this panel. Uh, we are one speaker short, but it's my task, I guess, to say good morning and uh, say something that's interesting and provocative enough to wake everybody up. So let me first say uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Titinan, for having me on the panel. Gwen, distinguished co-panelists. Um, and I do have a PowerPoint. I don't know how many will, of you will be able to read this. It's, hope, it's mostly visuals, so hopefully it will be relatively easy to see. And I will start with something that um, everybody knows, but it's still interesting to, to see this visually. Um, and uh, even if you can't read the details, uh, the interesting thing here is that what it shows is that this region is the fastest growing in the world. And these are data for this year projected growth data. And with Thailand is the very, very short uh, dot in the middle and being the exception. So Thailand only growing at 1.5% this year and it projected up to 3.5, maybe actually less next year. And uh, But you can see all the other countries in this region are growing quite a bit and much faster than the rest of the world. And you just heard about the disease in Japan. Uh, we all know what's happening in Japan right now. Europe is uh, threatening to go into deflation as well. So the global economy as a whole is not doing that well, but this region actually is. Uh, China still growing above 7% and continue, projected to continue growing above 7%, leading the region. Vietnam by 5.5% and so on. So it, the message here is this region is growing fast and it's growing fast and has a chance to grow even faster through integration. And this is what this is about. Um, so this is about the part of how can growth help people. In the World Bank group, we're about poverty reduction and about sharing prosperity among all the people. It's not just about economic growth that benefits a few people. It really is about economic growth that benefits everybody. And what you can see here is that 
it, around the region, uh, you have had some patterns of inequality, and you can see that this region hasn't done so badly uh, in terms of reducing inequality, but from a very high level. So historically, inequality in this region is high, but it's started to come down. Now in Thailand, for example, it's still, you know, 48% is below 50 now. Income, this is measured by the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality and shows you how concentrated incomes are. And 48% is pretty high. Uh, by international standards and this is by income you can also measure this by consumption or by wealth and you get different numbers but the bottom line is however you measure it whether it's income or consumption or wealth is very high in this region even though it's been declining somewhat and so the critical question then is if we want growth growth to continue but growth to continue in a way which helps everybody. How do we do that? And what I'm putting out here on this slide, this is not visuals, uh, I'll just talk about it a little bit, is that we see three key avenues to doing that. The first one is openness and integration. And I'll, this is sort of, I'll talk about that more in the rest of the talk. But I wanted to put this slide as a context slide to, to share with you my thought that openness and integration in this region is one of three pillars, one of three pathways to get to what we ultimately want to get to, which is income growth and equality and equal chances and opportunities for people. Integration, to our mind, is not a goal and an end in itself. Integration is good and we support integration because it will help raise incomes, because it will help reduce inequality in the long term, if it is done right. So that's why we support openness and integration in this region and everywhere else around the world. The World Bank is a global player and we are unabashed, unapologetic globalists and integrationists, if you will, but we're doing so not because it's good by itself. We're doing that because we think it's good for raising incomes and making people better off around the world. And there are two parts there, and I'll talk about those two parts in a second a little more. One is promoting trade, and the next one is improving infrastructure connectivity. There are lots of other aspects of um, integration and openness. We just heard about labor mobility and so on, uh, and I'll say a little bit about this, but other panelists will talk about other aspects of openness as I'm sure. Now I do want to say uh, that there are these two other pillars uh, that are important for reducing poverty and making people better off. One of them is inclusion and these are deliberate policies, deliberate institutions, deliberate efforts that countries make to help everybody so that the benefits from integration, the benefits from growth don't just accrue to a few people but to everybody. One of the key things there is education, and education for all, equal opportunities to good education for all. This is a critical agenda item in our view across the entire region. It's also important in Thailand. Thailand has been talking about serious education reforms for decades, has not accomplished it yet question mark, when will Thailand accomplish it? Can Thailand, can other countries in the GMS region actually become and continue to be competitive without such reforms? As you know, that's related to inequality in Thailand. Uh, people in Bangkok enjoy a good education by and large, but outside Bangkok chances are opportunities for a good education are very limited. Uh, the specifics are a little different, they're very country specific, so if you go to other countries in this region, in the sub-region, it's a little different, but the common theme here is that in order for people to reap the benefits from, from integration and openness and trade, it's important that people have uh, equal opportunities, equal access to good education. And 
unless that's done, you will have a few people benefit from trade and openness, but not the population at large. Another one is access to finance. Uh, this is very important, for example, in countries like Myanmar, where between 5 and 10 percent, depending on estimates of people have a bank account, only 20 percent of people have access to credit. Now, the numbers are significantly higher in this country, as you all know. Again, this is country specific, but the common thing here is that in order to allow people to benefit from the benefits of trade, it's important that they can actually trade. And in order to trade, typically you need a bank account and typically you need money and you need credit. And if you don't have access to credit and you don't have access to a bank account, you're unlikely to benefit from trade and openness. So these are critical preconditions for people to benefit from integration. There are several others, these are exemplary. Last one is jobs. Um, and there I want to highlight this is partly domestic, partly integration, but in all of the countries in this subregion, agricultural productivity is important because there's still significant numbers of people who are employed in agriculture. Agriculture is uh, you know, declining as a sector in terms of the weight in the economy, but there's still a large number of people working in agriculture. And for them to uh, improve their well-being, for them to get richer, raise their incomes, increased productivity is critical. And that does mean things that are purely domestic, like extension services for farmers and so on, but it also does mean improved trade in agriculture. Um, then uh, there is me jobs are created mostly by SMEs and I think many of the countries in this region have platforms, policy platforms to promote SME growth of various kinds. I won't go into detail, I just put this out there. I've talked a lot about this slide and there was no picture on there but just to give the key message again, so openness and integration is good for people in the sub-region. Uh, in order for people to reap the benefit, it's important in addition to integration that there is inclusion and there is jobs. I'll move on. Um, this is just a quick uh, picture. I think this will be all on our website and downloaded. I don't know how it will be distributed, but it's open information in case you can't read it. It's just a snapshot, if you will, of uh, progress in toward the AEC. Uh, in just you know uh, a little uh, less than a month, we'll have the start of the Asian Economic Community Year 2015, and the goal is, and the countries in this subregion are part of the AEC to. Uh, complete, if you will, a uh, high, much higher degree of openness next year. So the message here is there's lots of potential. And for example, you can see tariffs are being reduced. That's a big uh, pro and a big point of progress. And I'll talk about this more in a second. At the same time, there's question about what's next. That's about the free flow of goods. Then there is the issue of free flow of services. Lots of talk about it so far. How much action is there? We should debate this, we should discuss this. It's work in progress, but much remains to be done. Then there is skilled labor movement. We just heard about this, you know. Japan has been very hesitant to do that. Countries in this region, some are hesitant or not. We all know, for example, that Thailand does not allow the free flow of professionals like doctors, lawyers, engineers, journalists, architects, and so on. So there are restrictions on this, and other countries have the same restriction. There are mutual recognition agreements between some countries, but there is much greater scope for free mobility of labor, which is important for actually uh, in greater integration for all the benefits that uh, were mentioned. Um, there's free flow of capital and free flow of investment. So these are five dimensions, if you will, a snapshot of what can be done toward integration at the AEC. And progress on some, uh, more talk and less action on others. Oops, sorry. Now this shows you on trade, uh, it, the, the issue that is the critical issue of trade of goods, that tariffs have come down. That's the left-hand uh, part of the slide. And you don't even need to read the details. You just see the lines coming down. And it shows you that the tariffs are coming down. And what you see on the right 
is that so-called non-tariff measures, these are restrictions on trade other than tariffs. So that you only allow a certain amount of goods to come in or you only allow the goods to come in under certain conditions. Um, and this type of restriction is extraordinarily common. There are more than 3,500 different non-tariff restrictions in ASEAN across different uh, industries that impede trade. And what happens often when countries reduce tariffs that they raise non-tariff barriers instead. And so I think this is where, as a World Bank group, we want to put a warning and we'll put it in form of this, uh, if you will, cartoon. Uh, the question is, you know, is 2016 just going to look the same as 2014, but instead of tariffs, we'll have NTMs. And we hope that's not the case, that's something that should be avoided. I don't think, and we hope it won't, won't happen, but I think this is the agenda that after re reducing tariffs, uh, the NTMs, the non-tariff measures, are also going to be reduced. Now a little bit about um, infrastructure and energy. Um, we, there was already talk about the Mekong, and I know others will talk about the Mekong and the water bit. There's lots to say about the water and the integration of the river and water uses. Um, because others will talk about this, I will talk about energy and about roads. Um, what you can see here on the left is the, is the energy. Um, uh, picture and the message here is that um, energy um, integration is is really compared to what it could be in its infancy. So there is some minimum degree of uh, you know of connectivity in the grid, but it could be much much bigger and much more intensive. Um, and that would be actually be good both from the point of view of efficiency in the energy trade between producers and consumers. It also would increase reliability um, because, you know, if you have a drought in one country which depends on hydro, for example, then you can import from another country. You have greater reliability of supply for industry. There are lots and lots of um, advantages for everybody. Um, and But it requires significant investments and it also requires overcoming political hurdles because there are winners and losers potentially in this and so the question is how can one uh, construct a, a, a path toward connectivity and the electricity grid where all the countries are better off. Uh, for example, between Laos and Thailand, how can one construct a, a, a working solution toward integration where both Laos and Thailand are better off as a result? It's possible, but it requires political will on both sides. And that's not just for Laos and Thailand. You can do that, uh, use the same example for other countries in the grid. Um, so this is political economy as well as economics, as well as engineering and technical aspects. They all need to come together to make this happen. But it's worth it, and you can see it in other regions which have achieved some connectivity in the electricity grid, where as a result, everybody is better off. Um, roads, I think, uh, is a similar issue. Again, uh, there are some road connections, but this is an area where there could be much more. There are big plans. Uh, these are plans that are drawn, drawn up, I think, in 2010 is this map from, because of 2011, it's the official ASEAN plan for uh, building roads in this sub-region. Uh, but as you can see, the fat lines are the ones that are planned, and you can see that the important parts are all fat, fat drawn. Only the, the ones that are not fat are the existing roads. So pretty much the bulk of that interconnectivity of roads infrastructure is in plan, various stages of plan and not yet realized. And again, these um, um, 
investments require political commitment uh, over a long period of time because there's no use, for example, if a country builds a highway to the border and then there's nothing connecting on the other side. And so it's very important to do that jointly so if you have cross-border transit, actually you get advantages on both sides of the border. That's possible. Again, there are good examples of how that can be done. Uh, but I think for, for this sub-region, it remains a major challenge. And just as an example, I think 40%, almost 40% of the suppliers in ASEAN, uh, developing country suppliers in the value chain, consider the transport, the lack and weakness of the transport infrastructure a critical constraint for them to moving up the value chain. The World Bank Group regularly does these surveys of suppliers, and so suppliers are asked to list what are the most important factors impeding their moving up the value chain, and so almost 40% list this as one of the two critical constraints. So it is a real constraint for, for, for industry and for competitiveness in this region, and a lot can be gained by uh, improving these energy and road networks in the region. So I just want to sum up. Uh, first, um, we think that integration can uh, improve the li lives of people in this region. It can raise incomes and it can also, it can reduce inequality and poverty, but provided there's also inclusion and there's jobs. Those are important. Without that, what you'll get is increased incomes, but the incomes will be very unequally distributed and the few will benefit and the masses will not. Um, specifically, we want to put out a, a, a flag that there's an opportunity after the reduction in tariff also to reduce NTMs and to improve mobility of labor, and then make a plug for, uh, if you will, uh, improving the electricity and road networks in particular, because they are really Im important to uh, improving the competitiveness in the sub-region. And I know water is also important, but I leave this to my colleagues. Thank you all very much. Thanks for uh, an excellent comprehensive rundown of the issues, um, Ulrich. Uh, we'll turn now to Murakoshi-san. Um, over to you. Sawadika. Uh, good morning and bonjour. Uh, ohayou gozaimasu. Uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, my name is Murakoshi from Mitsubishi Corporations here in the Thailand Mitsubishi Company, Thailand Limited. It is a subsidiary of Mitsubishi Corporation in Japan. I would like to thank Mr. Iguchi and the ISIS people uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to everybody today. I believe I am on the only panelist from the private sector today so I hope uh, my speech is you know worthwhile for everybody today. Then you know my speech is you know just only three part. You know first of all, you know, this is a good chance to you know uh, promote our company itself. So that what you know Sogo Shosha, a trading company, is doing in a global basis. This is first point. Then the second point is how observe. We, we observe these regions. Then uh, number three is, you know, how to, uh, and uh, as, you know, uh, Ms. Gwen told, introduced, you know, this is my second assignment in Thailand. I love Thailand so that, you know, this is my personal opinion, but, you know, how, you know, Thailand should do. This is, you know, three part. And the first, you know, uh, this is introduction of the Mitsubishi corporations. We Mitsubishi Corporation have you know two hundred offices in ninety countries in you know, globally. And uh, this if you know talking about uh, Thailand, uh, we have hundred Japanese employees here in uh, Thailand and, and uh, forty subsidiary companies and also the one more than one hundred investment in you know, Thailand. Then uh, we are now concentrating into the Asian uh, area. Then, especially in Thailand, we are heavily shifted, you know, our resources. I mean, the capital and you know, human resource. 
เป็นอ่า but you know เขาอยู่ our company is you know looking at you know from in the past and from now on you know maybe we have no interest in the name of the just the name of the the greater Mekon subregions or AC or you know economic corridor or BRICS maybe these kind of the name is put by the Nikkei and uh, actual you know from the you know, actual businessman you know this is you know helpful for understand the you know concept but you know we don't see because we don't say you no know, because of the the great mekon sub region because of the BRICS we are do, we are not doing the business but anyway you know what we are looking at is only business opportunity and also chance to generate profit as a result of that we became to have 200 offices in 90 country in a global basis then you know one of the you know good example is in a thailand we uh, we had a good chance to generate the profit then also we had a, so many business chance opportunities in this country so that you know we pile up you know all the, our capitals and also the number of you know employees here then uh, i move to the second point then uh, how observe you know and uh, from now on how we are observing actually observations of the japanese businessman is the same as you know Nikkei because every businessman is read Nikkei every morning so that as Mr. Igush already explained problem is maybe you know population and, and especially in uh, labor age issues looking at the this you know let's say the greater Mekong sub regions in Vietnam and the Laos and Cambodia and the Thailand and the Myanmar you know of course you know thailand is still uh, more advanced than the others but you know if you look at the only each country every country have the some limitations in case of the thailand as mr Iguchi mentioned that you know already maybe you know it will decrease in the populations of you know especially you know labor age but you know talking about other countries every country has some limitations also so that you know maybe it, in order to solve the this kind of the lip, wipe off the such kind of the limitations and also realize further grow of the economy of these kind these countries uh, let's call you know uh, continental ASEAN or mainland uh, ASEANs uh, one you know basic concept may be the greater Mekong sub region idea of the greater Mekong sub regions because you know each country has some limited you know populations you know Vietnam is a 95 you know I'm not sure uh, exactly because I'm businessman not you know uh, professor of the you know, university and uh, maybe you know birds uh, Vietnam has you know 95 then uh, Cambodia to 20,000 more than 20,000 and the Laos less than 10,000 in a Thailand 65 then uh, Myanmar recently 51 or something and uh, each country has only such you know limited population not like uh, China not like uh, India not like United States but if we gather all of these countries, it becomes rather big, you know, market. Then if market is big, we will find, we will be able to find out the, some business opportunity and also the chance to generate a profit in the future. So from that viewpoint, 
we still, you know, it is not, you know, uh, company's policy, only my observation, but, you know, still Mitsubishi will emphasize in this area. I'm, I'm emphasizing mean, you know, to continue to make investment in this area. But, you know, in order to realize it, just only one condition that, you know, it is actually unite to be the one market. Then, uh, of course, AEC or Great Mekong Subregion, there are several problems or, you know, still some barrier to, you know, uh, wipe out. But, you know, one, you know, good example is European community, I thought. Then uh, maybe as, you know, everybody know and, you know, professor know well, better than me, European community started from 1952. It was uh, coal and iron uh, community, European coal and iron community. Then uh, growing up, become the European community, and then now, you know, European unions. Then uh, I hope this region become, you know, gradually uh, solve the, you know, differences of the each countries and become the uh, Europe, realize European uh, uh, unions. Then, uh, if just only consider the Thailand, I would like Thailand be being German in the such you know communities. Then uh, so that history tell us that what German did in the past since you know uh, 1952 until. 2000, some year in uh, realized, you know, uh, European unions. Sometimes German sacrifice by themselves, opening the door to, the, you know, other European countries. Recently, of course, you know, some, you know, currency pro financial problems in the Greek or other countries, German sacrifice everybody remember it happened in a very you know two or three years ago so in order to be like a german in this region i would like to propose you know thailand have to open the door to the neighboring countries no of course you know i'm japanese so that please open the door for the japanese company but you know not only the japanese companies you know or to you know neighboring countries then uh, facilitate the trade of you know even just only that you know actually you know commodities trade but also the exchange you know of labor or such kind of thing then uh, this is a very important thing for the thailand to still number one country in these regions then if government or Thai people agree such ideas and you know let's you know they will prepare such kind of you know mindset we Mitsubishi Corporation and I'm sorry we not Mitsubishi Corporation I Akira Murakoshi will continue to invest in a Thailand because Thailand has you know already very big advantage concentration of the industries you know educated peoples and uh, skilled laborers you know comparing with the other countries you know oh, thailand has a good advantage at this moment so if you know thinking about the efficiency of the, you know investment i will invest in a thailand then you know grasp the all of the, you know these countries market this is my basic idea. I'm not sure Tokyo people what they are thinking. And the last, you know, uh, in the last, you know, still, you know, Mitsubishi Corporation, you know, continue to invest in and in increasing the people. But, you know, please, 
you know, uh, just, you know, I commented that what we are doing in a neighboring countries like uh, Myanmar, two years ago, we have just only one Japanese in uh, Yangon, then only five staff, national staff there. But now we have uh, 10 Japanese in uh, 25 or something, the national staff, more over already, you know, tripled. This is, you know, private company's activity. If we feel that the chance, we are moving very fast. I'm, you know, personally sticking to the Thailand, but, you know, uh, this is like a activity. Then also the Vietnam, you know, we can say same thing. Because of the Doi Moi policy, we expand, you know, activity of Ho Chi Minh office very bit. Then uh, still, you know, Cambodia and uh, Laos, it is, you know, not so big office we have, just only one Japanese guy and then uh, 10 or 12, you know, national stuff. Then looking at, you know, another countries like Indonesia and Singapore, uh, remarkable thing is Indonesia, you know, well, nowadays maybe Indonesia, uh, investment in Indonesia is uh, bigger than, you know, Thailand. Not only because of the oil, not only because of the gas, because of the market. This is, you know, uh, my, my observation in the ASEAN countries, but I would like to cheer up, you know, Thai economy and the Thai people, and, you know, uh, I would like to grow in that, and Mitsubishi Corporation would like to grow in that together with the Thai people and the Thai society and the Thai company. Thank you very much, this is my comment. Thanks very much, Murakoshi-san. That was a fascinating insight into uh, how Japanese companies or Mitsubishi Corporation are viewing um, uh, the region and, uh, interestingly, Thailand. Now we've had. <laughs>